think I have a microphone. Oh, I do. Um, welcome to our Apex lecture today. My name is uh, Dave Lunt. I'm a history professor here, and I've been asked, and I've, 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 I'm super happy to introduce uh, somebody that I respect a lot and like a lot. This is Dr. Richard Kimball. Uh, he's here to speak to us today. Um, let me tell you a little about him. Um, my first interaction with Dr. Kimball was before I even met him. Um, I was in graduate school and, and people were talking about him and asking if I knew him because I was from Utah and he was working in Utah. And his reputation definitely, um, definitely met my expectations. Uh, we, we met when I was still in graduate school and, and I've looked up to him ever since. Um, Dr. Kimball is an associate professor of history at Brigham Young University. He has a PhD from Purdue uh, University. He's the author of, a, of a, two books. Um, the more recent is called Legends Never Die, Athletes and Their Afterlives in Modern America. And a little earlier, he wrote Sport in Zion, Mormon Recreation Between 1890 and 1940. Uh, Dr. Kimball currently lives in Mapleton with his wife and three children. He teaches at Brigham Young University courses in sport history, American culture, and has all sorts of interesting uh, projects going on there. And I'll point out the true mark of a distinguished professor is Dr. Kimball has a Wikipedia page. So something for us all to aspire to. His talk today will focus on his research concerning deaf football players at the turn of the 20th century and how these players use the sport to promote sign language and deaf culture in a time when assimilation and lip reading were becoming the norm. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Kimball. Well, hello, and thank you for coming. Well, I first want to thank uh, SUU and Apex uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'm especially grateful that uh, you've come today. I appreciate that. I feel lucky personally just to be out of the house, let alone the county, so this is pretty special for me. I also want to thank Dr. Uh, Lynn Vartan, who is the type of superhero who keeps universities moving forward even in the most difficult of circumstances. I should thank Dave Lunt as well and for that uh, great introduction. Uh, Dave is the type of guy that you would drive 400 miles to spend an afternoon with. And so I'm looking forward to this afternoon as well. Uh, I don't think he's a superhero yet, though. I'm thrilled to be here to talk a little bit about how deaf men use the new sport of football to fight for sign language and fight against the prevailing notions about deaf physicality and weakness in the early 20th century. I've decided to read my paper today because I want you to hear as many voices from the time as possible. Sports historians have never shown much interest in the athletic activities of the deaf community. A typical American sports historian's knowledge of deaf sports begins and ends with William Hoy, nicknamed Dummy, a deaf baseball star in the 1890s um, noted for his on-field skill as well as for his lack of hearing. Over the course of his 14-year major league career, the diminutive center fielder had a lifetime batting average of 288 and played a mean outfield, especially for a guy who couldn't hear the crack of the bat. He certainly deserves to be remembered. But contemporary sports historians, unable or unwilling to see the centrality of sports to deaf culture, have been indefensibly slow to appreciate how deaf sports helped members of the deaf community to integrate into the American mainstream while simultaneously protecting a sense of separateness and distinction. A key example of this occurred at the turn of the 20th century when reformers sought to transform deaf society by promoting oralism and lip reading at the expense of signing. To fight against this effort at normalization, 
deaf men took to the playing fields to affirm their physical equality in the most normalizing American pursuit of the time, playing football. The deaf men's success on the gridiron simultaneously argued for the strength of deaf culture and community. In the second half of the 19th century, deaf people in the United States faced a perfect storm of opposition and controversy. At times, it seemed like every social, scientific, and cultural reformer had discovered the deaf and was determined to assimilate deaf men and women into the mainstream of American society. Eugenicists, led by Alexander Graham Bell here, generally classified deaf people with the mentally disabled and other socially undesirable people, such as criminals, paupers, and alcoholics. Although the idea was completely unfounded, many educated Americans associated deafness with what they called feeble-mindedness. Bell advocated that the congenitally deaf should voluntarily forego marriage as a way to stem the genetic tide of deaf descendants. He feared, as he wrote in 1884, that the, quote, intermingling of congenital deaf mutes through a number of successive generations should result in the formation of a deaf variety of the human race, end quote. Even Edward M. Gallaudet, the president of Gallaudet College, advised that congenitally deaf couples should not marry on general principles, although he acknowledged that a hard and fast rule could not be applied in all cases. Deaf educator Harry Best, in his monumental book, The Deaf, claimed that most Americans in 1914 viewed deaf people as a strange and uncertain body of human beings, removed in their actions, manners, and modes of thought from the rest of society. In Best's estimation, the proverbial man in the street in the early 20th century approached deaf people with wonder, misgiving, fear, aversion, and believed that the deaf were more or less distinct in their thoughts and actions from other people, and somehow unnatural or uncanny. Commonly, the deaf were tagged as defective, a term that connoted mental or even moral aberrance. Other defective groups included the feeble-minded, and consumptives. To propel deaf people toward the cultural mainstream, oralist educators reworked the standard curriculum to exclude sign language in favor of teaching speech and lip-reading skills, which they believed would help deaf people to appear as normal as possible. To make matters worse, oralists associated sign language with primitive forms of communication used by inferior peoples, as they wrote. The renowned scientist Charles Darwin disparaged gestural signing as a communication system, quote, used by the deaf and dumb and by savages, end quote. Hearing parents decried sign language for their deaf children in favor of oral communication, which appeared less exotic or unusual. Politicians believed that the educational approaches based on sign language wasted taxpayer money. In 1900, nearly 40% of American deaf students were enrolled in oralist schools. 80% attended schools that, in, excuse me, by 1920, 80% of deaf students attended schools that shunned sign language altogether. James F. Brady, a former student in the Pennsylvania Institute for the Deaf, recognized the arguments, put, the arguments for equality put forward by deaf athletes. In industrial and social periods, he wrote in 1924, we deaf people are reminded consciously or otherwise of our handicap, and we are different from others. But in sports, well, that is another matter. There, we are all right. Such expressions were typical of deaf male athletes who maintained that the meritocracy of the playing field 
provided an unequaled opportunity to assert their equality. Popular deaf periodicals of the time included The Silent Worker, published by the New Jersey School for Deaf Mutes, The Deaf Mutes Journal, which came out of upstate New York, and The Buff and Blue, which was published by Gallaudet College and named for their team colors. We'll get into that a little later. These journals reflected the deaf community's interest in athletics by providing widespread coverage of a variety of sports. Football proved most popular and received an outsized share of column space in these monthly publications. A close reading of these and other periodicals reveals how deaf schools, especially Gallaudet College, used football to argue for equality and to forge deaf masculinity. Playing football at Gallaudet, where on-field signs were integral to the team's success and widely hailed by the sporting press, challenged oralist teachers and administrators throughout the deaf educational community. Excelling at the new scientific sport, deaf footballers decried any lingering association with savagery and backwardness. Playing for more than trophies and titles, deaf athletes sought to prove their equality with the hearing while showcasing the power of sign language to their oralist opponents. The very act of playing against hearing teams implicitly argued for deaf equality. The deaf footballer's physical prowess belied the idea that deaf people suffered from weak constitutions and physical limitations. Athletic victories, according to the New York Journal, had a, quote, good effect on the public mind and helped to spread the truth that being deaf in no way indicates inferiority, either mental or physical, but is simply and solely inability to hear. In all other human attributes, the deaf are like other people, end quote. Beginning in the 1880s, some deaf educators turned to athletics as a means of mediating perceived physical deficiencies. By competing against hearing opponents, deaf teams, in particularly the Gallaudet football team, proved that deaf students were prepared to compete in the real world. Football became a physical discourse which deaf people not only called, through which deaf people not only called for physical and cultural equality, but proved it on the field of competition. Here we go with, I'm not sure you can get a whole lot out of this picture, what's going on, but it gives a sense of an early game. Deaf participation in manly sports proved that with their physical strength and their sporting prowess, deaf men were up to any task. One chronicler of deaf athletics concluded that, quote, weight for weight, height for height, and equal mental nimbleness, the deaf are as good as the best. Administrators at the New Jersey School for Deaf Mutes turned to rough sports like rugby and football to toughen up their male student body. Not only would sports keep the boys out of trouble, quote, baseball, football, and such sports are capital exercise and make the body strong, active, and healthy, end quote. For school leaders, quote, the chief value of athletic sports is to cultivate courage, energy, and the habit of acting in concert with others for a definite purpose. But there was also another purpose at play. The school believed that, quote, a nation of boys who would not risk bruises and broken bones in their sports would grow up into a nation of men who would not dare to face wounds and death on the battlefields in defense of their homes. Such namby-pamby boys would not be likely to make tough men such as are needed in business and in the trades. By all means, let boys play all the rough, hardy games and take their bruises and bumps in good part. It will also help to make men of them, which is what we are trying to do by education." End quote. So an occasional coll a broken collarbone or dislocated finger was simply part of the process of using manly sports to turn boys into men. Sports taught lessons that could never be learned in the classroom. 
Athletic training prepared young men to enter the cutthroat competition of the real world. Using language suffused with the ideas of social Darwinism, students emphasized that, quote, competition in honorable rivalry is a good thing, end quote. In fact, they knew that, quote, one can only make his way in the world by a constant fight for a foothold against all comers and couldn't see why the leading principle in life should be, com- be excluded from the preparations for life provided by the school. Athletic training and competition became a type of active learning where the education emerged from the action. The students concluded that, quote, there are no lessons more useful for practical success in life nor more valuable in forming character than those which can be learned in athletics. Learn how best to make your fight. Fight fair, fight hard, fight to the end. Don't crow if you get beat. Don't sulk or whimper if you are beaten." End quote. Recent graduates attested to the idea of the playing field as a proving ground. One male Gallaudet alum asserted, quote, There is no better moral training in the battle of life than that of having a part in putting a football over the goal line against tremendous odds. The the impressions thus gained will last through life and enable the player later on to push to the front in the face of difficulties that might have baffled him had his nerve been tempered by athletic training. End quote. Once a deaf athlete had proven his mettle on the playing field, he was bound to make a record of some account in the outside world. To survive in the heartless reality of of competitive capitalism, deaf men required training that went beyond the classroom. By adding a dash of Knut Rockne to the social Darwinism of Herbert Spencer, deaf athletes could expect to conquer the business and professional worlds as well. The epicenter of deaf deaf football was Gallaudet College in Washington, D.C. Founded in 1857 as the Columbia Institution for the Deaf and Dumb and Blind, the school grew over the next 30 years into the only college for the deaf in the United States. Gallaudet graduates carried not only their pedagogical training, but also their love of football to deaf high schools and athletic clubs throughout the country. With the backing of fans and faculty alike, schools for the deaf turned to football with unequaled passion. While basketball, baseball, and track and field enjoyed seasonal popularity, football dominated the sports calendar. I guess some things never change. Looking closely at Gallaudet's football team, around the turn of the 20th century, lays bare the centrality of the sport to the student body and explains how and why deaf colleges embraced football. In the early 1870s, a group of Gallaudet students began to play what they called the rugby game, a slightly Americanized version of the English sport. After practicing for several weeks, the original buff and blue squad, they already had their colors picked out, they searched for an opponent, but no other schools in Washington played the new rough and tumble game. After much cajoling, a team from Columbian College, now George Washington University, agreed to play. When the Gallaudet team arrived at Columbian, they taught their opponents how the game was played. Following a rudimentary introduction, the Columbian men decided that, quote, they were not going to risk their necks in any such muss, unquote, and proposed that they play real football instead. Compromise prevailed, and an enthusiastic game of association football or soccer followed. The Gallaudet squad returned home disappointed because the game, quote, seemed a lame and impotent conclusion to our vigorous practice for a rugby game. By about 1880, American football had taken root on the the well-manicured lawns of Gallaudet's Kendall Green. The Green, which hosted Washington's annual tennis tournament, as well as baseball and other games, 
became the center place of football at the college. The origins of football at the school remain somewhat shrouded. Now, the most credible version of the creation story credits Jack Pickering, the son of a Gallaudet professor, um, as, as the father of football at the Deaf College. He claimed to have brought the game home from Amherst, where he was going to school himself. Pickering and other college-aged visitors taught the basics of the game to Gallaudet students and then proceeded to show the home team how the game was played. On one occasion, the sons of Supreme Court Justice John Marshall Har Harlan joined in the fun. A particularly hardy and strong Harlan brother simply tucked the ball under his left arm and pushed away would-be tacklers with his right hand, leaving them spinning and sprawling on the ground while he rushed the length of the field. From such experiences recalled one early Gallaudet player, quote, we learned many tricks that stood us in good stead in besting our, op our, our opponents in the District of Columbia. They, the coaches, seemed to take pleasure in teaching us and rejoiced in our victories over others. In 1883, Gallaudet fielded a full-blown football squad, complete with uniforms and a coach. The players sewed the uniforms themselves, making sure that they fit tightly so that opponents could knit so that opponents could not get a good hold when trying to make a tackle. Lulu Chickering, along with other faculty ladies, knit the team's first football caps. However, the caps weren't nearly as snug as the rest of the uniforms and fell off when the players started to run. The team's initial contest was reputedly the first football game played south of the Mason-Dixon line. There were no pads or helmets, and their, quote, their only shock-absorbing equipment were shaggy growths of beard and whiskers. Kind of like Professor Lunt. The earliest days of football at the college showed the, showed the integration of the game into the power structure of the deaf community. Remarkably, five members of the 1883 team went on to become presidents of the National Association of the Deaf. Skylar Long, who had never seen a football game, maintained a clear memory of the team returning to the campus after a game in 1884. Quote, I had not long been at college before I had a vivid impression of the realities of the game. One of the players came home from Baltimore with his face in a beautiful condition of mutilation with most of his front teeth knocked out. The player, Irishman Robert Lyons, was celebrated and decorated for valor on the field. Gallaudet players wasted little time in proselytizing the game throughout the student body, which was all male until 1886. With approximately 70 men enrolled um, at the college, the team needed every possible resource, especially when playing against opponents with much larger student populations like Georgetown, Johns Hopkins, and the U.S. Naval Academy. Although Gallaudet teams played valiantly, they were typically outmatched in those early years. The Naval Academy was a favorite opponent because the cadets, quote, were such gentlemanly fellows and treated us so handsomely that although they usually beat us, we enjoyed playing with them more than any other of our opponents remembered Olaf Hansen, a member of the 1883 team, which I don't have a picture of. Didn't quite, they don't go that early. But playing the Navy was a big deal for Gallaudet. Even college president Edward Gallaudet joined in the chorus singing the praises of football, especially the institutional advantages provided by the game. On November 7, 1891, Gallaudet recorded the following in his diary. I don't think that's what he's recording in this picture, but I'm just pretending. So put on your, uh, use your imagination there. And he's writing, our football team with a good many others, fans, went to Annapolis today. The cadets team won by a score of only six to zero. Representatives from the Naval Academy praised the Gallaudet team as the finest they had met that year. 
the visiting college understood that by simply competing against the hearing cadets, the deaf team notched a victory. As proven on the field of play, Gallaudet College and the U.S. Naval Academy were more alike than different. Deaf students may have been prohibited from joining the Navy, but they could strike a blow for equality on the football field. An implicit recognition of the similarity between deaf and hearing players occurred whenever, quote, the students of our college came into pleasant and creditable relations with those of other institutions of learning. This sense, the sense of equality nurtured on the field reinforced Gallaudet College's approach to education, especially its commitment to sign language and its growing prominence among peer institutions. Moreover, other administrators wanted, quote, to have the deaf play the game because it is the game of other schoolboys, and we want our pupils to be in touch with the life of the hearing at every possible point. When Gallaudet stepped on the gridiron to play hearing colleges, more than wins and losses hung in the balance. Playing at Johns Hopkins or the Naval Academy, win or lose, displayed the grit and metal of the deaf players and proved their manliness to themselves, their fans, and their opponents. Here's the crew from 1901. A typical football season at Gallaudet began just as students arrived to campus in the fall. For example, in 1901, team captain Horace Waters, a senior at the college, issued the call to interested players to report to practice on September 18th. I know that sounds late in today's modern college football wor world, but I think here it's a little, it was a little early for college football practice to start. With just 10 days to prepare for a game with the nationally prominent Carlisle Indians, the team practiced seven times before traveling to Pennsylvania for the match. Not unexpectedly, the men in buff and blue fell to the Indians 19 to 6. Despite the defeat, the game gave the men confidence and, quote, they gradually worked into a state of perfection rarely seen in teams having much more material to choose from. The 1901 team must have been really good because they have several pictures available. The remainder of the schedule pitted the squad against formidable foes from larger colleges, including UVA, Hopkins, Georgetown, the University of Maryland, and the Washington YMCA. The Gallaudet team became one of the most formidable 11s on the southern gridiron, according to one source. The team played 10 games in total, all against hearing teams, and finished with a record of seven wins, two losses, and a tie. Victories on the football, on the football field united the student body and, and brought glory and renown to the college, according to the Buff and Blue new, um, magazine. If there, quote, if there is anything that makes an undivided student body, it is a victorious football team, end quote, advised the student newspaper following the successful 1901 season. Not every team, however, ended the season bathed in glory. Just four years later, the 1905 squad lost all eight games it played against other collegiate teams, although they did manage to beat the team representing the local Navy yard. Gallaudet's football miracle year occurred in 1899. That year, the team also finished with seven wins and two losses. Trained by instructors, graduates of Yale and Harvard, both well-versed in the tactics of the game, the Buff and Blue defeated the University of Virginia in Charlottesville 11 to five. That's pretty much the miracle. This unexpected success, according to one witness, Quote, was hailed with the greatest delight and the football heroes were greeted with bonfires and enthusiasm upon their return. After a close loss to Georgetown, the team regrouped to defeat the squad from the University of Maryland. A crowd of 3,000 attended the final game of the season, a 12-0 victory over the Washington YMCA. Thrilled with the splendid success of the men, the editors of the Buff and Blue 
thanked, quote, the players who have labored so faithfully to uphold the honor of Gallaudet on the athletic field and the students who have been so unstinted in their encouragement of the men and have stood so loyally by the team. Proof of equality was as clear as the numbers on the scoreboard, especially in 1899. At Gallaudet, football created bona fide masculine heroes. As Skylar Long remembered years after his playing days ended, the display of courage, physical determination, and resilience verified his manliness and provided an example for others. His description of football in the 1880s is worth quoting at length. It's not that length, not that much length, but. We played for sport's sake and learned the sportsman's code. In football, we wore arms in harness. Maybe our skulls were thicker in those days, for we did not put a padded leather pot over them. We wore thin canvas suits, bucked the line with bare heads, and met the onrush of our opponents with nothing but underclothes and canvas between our own bodies and the sinewy forms and hardened muscles hurled against us. There was no first aid man hovering along the line with a portable drugstore, like a buzzard above an expectant carcass or an undertaker taking the dying man's measure. A bottle of Arnica, which is basically like a bottle of Tylenol, was quite enough. But we played the game, and sages sang the glory of our heroes then, even as now. If the idea of singing sages stretched the truth a wee bit, some student poets did honor their football stars in verse. Our modern knight, written in 1893, rendered football players as modern Lancelots. To bear the ball beyond the goal, to check the rush, to tackle true, inflames as much the striving soul as joust or combat used to do. And who shall say that courage high has not its place in modern life when thronging thousands testify the manly love for manly strife? Our knights that nobly play their parts know the stern joys that warriors feel and canvas jackets cover hearts as brave as ever beat in steel. These glory men on the gridiron, veritable gods of the campus, measured up favorably against heroes ancient and modern. Deaf college football, according to one journalist, resembled nothing less than the famous battles in world his than famous battles in the world's history, including Hector and Achilles on the plains of Troy, Jesse James shooting his way across the American West and that avatar of college athletes everywhere, Tom Brown at Oxford. That's quite a motley crew there to get compared to, I'd say. Playing football manufactured masculinity in part because of the game's inherent violence. Broken bones, cracked heads, and bruised bodies proved the valor and courage of deaf men. In the mid-1890s, when mass momentum plays increased the likelihood and severity of injuries, deaf education leaders began to question the costs of fielding a team. Such questions seemed justified when J.L. Peterson, who played for a deaf school in Wisconsin, was killed in a game against Beloit College. Peterson's neck had snapped when a number of players piled on top of him. Gallaudet players were not immune from injury. Broken bones, lame ankles, sore knees, and headaches dogged nearly every player at some point. More serious injuries sidelined some team members. In the fall of 1903, one player was cut down by a willfully vicious blow in the ribs delivered by the fist of a Colombian halfback. The collision broke several of his ribs and lacerated both lungs. A year later, he was still recovering at his home in Colorado. Following this frenzy of violence, a former Gallaudet student denounced the game 
on the pages of The Silent Worker. The game of football, he wrote, has always impressed me as being brutal, dangerous, unattractive, uninteresting, a relic of barbarism, a sort of revised edition of the gladiatorial contest of ancient times, end quote. Noting a long list of injured or maimed players, including, quote, more than a corporal's guard of Gallaudet students who received broken bones and other sundry injuries at football, the correspondent concluded that the rules governing the sport must be revised and enforced or the game should be prohibited altogether. Like administrators at dozens of colleges around the country at the turn of the century, officials at Gallaudet eventually prohibited football, briefly, but not because of violence on the field or injuries to the players. In October 1902, students were barred from playing any form of football as punishment for a spell of tomfoolery that had embarrassed college leaders. On Friday, October 25th, as reported in The Silent Worker, quote, some of the students in a moment of fun removed all the chairs in the chapel to the stage in the rear and put the Bible in an out-of-the-way place, end quote. The boys knew the game was up when they entered the chapel the next morning to find faculty and female students already seated and waiting, but there were no empty chairs. The boys accepted their fate, trudged to the stage, and returned the chairs to their rightful stations. Probably chuckling to themselves, the boys must have felt some pride in pulling off the Friday night prank. The faculty, on the other hand, were greatly indisposed to accept the fun and termed it disorderly conduct. To get to the bottom of the matter, all five classes or uh, grades were called before President Gallaudet, who gave the perpetrators two days to confess. 48 hours later, no one had stepped forward. The faculty then made a rigid examination of the student body and came up empty. The students had kept their peace and foiled the system. Lacking any individuals to punish, the faculty took broad aim at the student body and summarily ended all further playing of football. No more intercollegiate games, no more practice, no kicking the ball in the quad. To add insult to injury, the, an the annual dance honoring the football team was canceled. All the students feel they have been unjustly treated, summarized one Gallaudet student. The response to the football prohibition illustrates how much football meant to the student body. Once the punishment was handed down, the heretofore taciturn students responded with petitions, arguments, and even a little name calling. The Student Athletic Association raised the loudest exclamation of disapproval in its petition for the return of the sport. The group argued that the lack of football revenue would deplete the association's budget and other sports would suffer. If they had to cancel games, no other colleges would, or other colleges would refuse to play Gallaudet in the future. The petition went to the faculty, but as reported, quote, all the boys received was a deaf ear, end quote. The prohibition severed a sacred bond between students and faculty. As one editorialist described, quote, in every college it is to the welfare of all that there be a friendly understanding between faculty and students. But what could strain the relations between the two more than the curtailment of a cherished privilege, end quote. Perhaps they deserved some punishment. But ending football was a bridge too far. The penalty did not seem to fit the crime. Students rationalized that, quote, there is not a college in this broad land but where the students play pranks of some kind. They have to give vent to their, pre their pent up feeling in some way, in some way or other, as long as they do not resort to destruction of property or cause excessive embarrassment, they should not be molested, end quote. There must be something wrong at the college in general, 
the students alleged. They, quote, feared that the old Puritan days with their strictness are being unearthed from the misty past, end quote. A week after the decision, emotions still ran high. All day the fellows were steaming and stewing, wrote a concerned student. By taking football away, the faculty, quote, had made us all barbarians. There's some echoes of Charles Darwin there. A handful of these barbarians, quote, out of a desire for revenge upon the faculty for putting an end to football playing, expressed their opposition by destroying college property, including chairs, tables, and desks. The misguided individuals who perpetrated this destruction remained at large several weeks after the event. After all that they had been through, students at Gallaudet could still keep a secret. Football returned to Kendall Green the next fall. After all, the game was far too important to the students, school administrators, and the broader deaf community to be sidelined for too long. Football remained a vital part of student life at Gallaudet throughout the 20th century. While in, well, and beyond the 20th century. While in some years the team was relegated to club status, generally the buff and blue played on the intercollegiate level. High points included a six-win season in 1930 and a 9-1 and record in 1987. Although the team often struggled on the field, typically winning about a third of its games, today's Gallaudet Bison football team continues to exemplify manliness, assertiveness, athleticism, and equality for many deaf Americans. In 2013, the Bison finished the season with a 9-1 record, captured their first Eastern Collegiate Football Conference title, and earned a berth in the Division III playoffs. Still struggling against age-old problems, the 21st century team in buff and blue, well, mostly blue, maintained the tradition of battling for more than victories on the field. Senior fullback and team co-captain Mike Hange explained that, quote, we all realize when you play for Gallaudet, you're playing for the deaf community across the country, end quote. Writing in the Atlantic Magazine in 2017, journalist Matthew Davis described the win that sent the Bison to the playoffs as something larger than just a victory for the football team. It was, he wrote, quote, a victory for people who had historically been mocked, dismissed, and marginalized throughout American history. Although separated by more than a century, the bison and the old buff and blue took to the gridiron to play a game that had implications well beyond the playing field. Both generations of deaf athletes hewed closely to the sentiments of, the silent, of a silent worker essay published in June 1892. Quote, there are no lessons more useful for practical success in life, nor more valuable in forming character than those which can be learned in athletics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kimmel. Thank you for coming and sharing your time with us and making the trip down. I really appreciate it. That's so nice of you to make the trip. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And I'm just amazed that all of you showed up. Yes, so and hello, hello to everyone watching online as well. We also want to let everybody know that we have both of your books here available for sale outside, um, Sports in Zion, uh, and then also The Afterlife of Athletes and all of that. So if you're interested in those, I can't wait to check them out. My first question to you is, how did you get involved in so much sports research? Were you yourself an athlete, or was it just something interesting? How did you get involved in these topics? My athletic career is not worth discussing at length. <laughs> okay. I, 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 so I played sports in high school, but for me, the interest was really historical. Ah. I mean, so I saw, I remember when I was an 11th grader in Mrs. Christensen's English class, we had to write our first research paper, and I wrote my paper on Jackie Robinson. Ah. And had to argue with Mrs. Christensen that that was a meaningful topic in American history. 
And so what I, my interest became using sport really as a lens to understand American culture. Oh, okay. To look at issues of race and gender. Mm. I mean, sport sort of reflects a lot of what Americans think. Right. As it changes through time. Right, and I'm excited to talk to you more about that later today. We'll be on the radio at 3 p.m., and we'll be turning that into a podcast. And I want to get into all of that, which is great. With regarding the, the deaf football players, where did you first um, stumble onto that phenomenon and, and the school and all of that? Stumble is a good word. Actually, and this is for I mean, a, a lot of the students here. The idea came, I learned about that deaf football existed from a student paper in a class on American sport history. Oh, okay. So years ago, a student who had, had an interest in um, the history of the deaf community, just that was her paper in um, sports history. And so I was really fascinated by the idea, I talked to her, and she provided actually a number of the quotations from a particular newspaper that were in the paper that I read. And so a lot can come from a student paper. She didn't want to pursue the topic any further, but it fascinated me, so I took it on. So be careful what you write. Copyright everything. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's really interesting. And, and as I was looking at the pictures and hearing the quotes, I was curious. Uh, it seems that most of the sources come from newspapers or the deaf publications. Is that where a lot of the research came? Or, or are there other books that can be found on the topic? There are a couple of books that cover sort of the broad strokes of um, American deaf sport history, but nothing goes into a great deal. They don't go into a great deal of detail about anything. Historically, the sources are almost um, completely newspapers, oh, publications. Right, okay. I mean, occasionally deaf sports, especially at Gallaudet, because it's in Washington, D.C., and there, and um, college sports in Washington, D.C., it's kind of a, a tight ring there. And so it did get some coverage in Washington, regular Washington newspapers, the New York Times occasionally, mm -hmm. but it's mostly in by the deaf press, which was very active at yeah. this point. Right. I mean, so there are, there were, I don't know, a dozen or more deaf publications wow. devoted, you know written by, reported by deaf people, composed by deaf people, printed by deaf people. Wow, Fasc what a great look into that culture at that time, fascinating. Yeah, and I think it's, it's if you're looking for a topic, you know, maybe in, in Dr. Lunt's sports history class, there's all kinds of deaf topics that are out there just waiting to be covered. Fascinating. Okay, well, any historians out there? I know we have some history students. This is a great, uh, a very fertile ground, it seems. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, you know, if you found any research on how the players communicated, did they tend to communicate more with sign language, more with lip reading, combination of both? Are there, did they talk about that? I mean, what, what was their way of communicating? So they mostly, they created... And this is actually the point where the most people have been interested in the, in um, deaf football. They've usually communicated by some form of sign language, not probably not sort of the American sign language that yeah. they uh, used in school, mm -hmm. but it was a sort of a gestural signing to each other. Mm -hmm. But this is an interesting point because occasionally they Gallaudet played other deaf schools. And so when you signed on, you signed the plays to each other, your opponents could figure out what the plays were. And so, at least as the story goes, in 1894, the um, captain of the Gallaudet football team devised a way to hide the signing from the other team, and that became the football huddle. Oh, wow! Or at least the, so the story goes. So in the, in the week of the Super Bowl, you can... Don't go to a Super Bowl party. Watch it on your own. That's right. But you could you can say, oh, do you remember? Do you know where the football huddle came from? And look at you. 
That's right. You're going to have trivia for this week for the big game. It's so fun that this ended up on this week. So that's fascinating that the huddle might have come from that. I'm I'm so intrigued. I know when we watch football today, we see um, the the boards with all the different pictures that are specific, and I would imagine that they came up with specific gestures for names of plays and things like that too to maybe try to keep it secret. Did you find anything about that? There's nothing that I could get into that I could find about how it worked on the field. Mm-hmm. And remember, this is a time when there, there are coaches and trainers who would run practice, mm-hmm. but once the game started, it was all, just, all the plays were decided on the field by the players. Right. So it was a much different time than the sign wagging yeah. and right. microphones in the quarterback's helmet. Interesting. And what is the state of uh, the, of deaf football today? Are there still uh, teams that are exclusively deaf participants, or are they more integrated? What what's the, what does it look like these days? So, for in the main, sort of Gallaudet College is still the center place. Okay. But on that team, there are, and now Gallaudet admits hearing students as well. But the team is a mix of students with profound hearing loss, with you know some hearing, and so it's it's a different way of. I mean, the college has changed, and so the football team has changed. But it still is the team for deaf Americans. Other than that, I think most deaf players are integrated onto into hearing teams, right, at right, high schools and that sort of. Great. Um, I know that you do a lot of other um, sports topics and sports research, and I wondered um, what's particularly turning you on right now in, in, in sports culture? Is there any topic that you're particularly interested in these days? Maybe is it COVID-related or, or anything, really? Well, at the moment, what, I, what I'm working on, so it's what fascinates me, is a biography of... Uh, BYU's legendary football coach, Lavelle Edwards. Oh, okay. And so I, that's kind of where my mind is yeah. at the moment. Yeah. I think when you think of what's happening in sports today, uh, I mean, what, what will be the impacts of COVID, I think, are important. But I think more so is what's going on, how professional and college players are dealing with uh, issues of race equality. Yeah. And I think that there's going to be, you know, some powerful statements come from um, not necessarily just deaf athletes, but I think um, about, you know, dealing with the Colin Kaepernick, right. started by the Colin Kaepernick mm-hmm. issue and moving forward. It just kind of brings full circle your concept as, of sports as being a powerful uh not necessarily dictator of culture, but reflective mirror of culture and, and also can move forward things in, in a lot of interesting ways. And I think when we're talking about the movement toward racial equality and the fight against systemic racism, that, I mean, that some leadership roles will be taken by athletes. Yeah, right. Well, I look forward to that. Well, I always ask um, kind of as a two last questions. Um, what are you reading now? I would like to ask people who are researchers and writers and authors, is there anything that you're reading right now that's really interesting and exciting to you? Yeah, I'm always reading at least, I always have one uh, DCI Banks book at the ready. So Okay. <laughs> but I'm reading uh, at the moment, Eric Foner's The Story of Freedom. Oh, wow. Which kind of takes the idea of freedom and seeking freedom and equality from the beginning of American history through the 20th century. Oh, that sounds like a great class. So also. anything by Eric Foner is good, but that, that one is on my table at the moment. And how do you spell his last name? F-O-N-E-R. Foner. Okay, great. Awesome. And then my last question for you, you know, we have a lot of students in the audience and students watching online. What advice do you have to students these days, and I know you're a professor as well, uh, or, or it could be just advice or something you wish you had known when you were in school? The advice I would have is, I think you should take courses from the best teachers. 
Find out who the best teachers are, regardless of what they teach. Hmm. Because that, the relationship between a teacher and a student is the most important thing that you can carry away from the university. And so regard, I'd say in my department uh, at BYU, I, have some, I know who the best teachers are. And I tell my students, take everything that Dr. So-and-so teaches. Even if you don't like the topic, it's much more about the teacher than the topic. So ask your professors, who are the best teachers in the department? And then follow them. Yeah, wow. I love that you talk about that relationship as being one of the great takeaways from college. I don't think anybody's ever said that on stage before, but I definitely think that that's true. So thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. Well, we are pretty much out of time, so that is just great. Um, we do want to remind everyone that there are books for sale. We will be on the radio later today. Um, I want to just extend my gratitude and thanks so much again for your time, and thank you for just sharing this awesome topic with us. I've learned so much, and I look forward to learning more. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Thank See you guys next week.